chemist spirits are the cure for the common cocktail. We really looked at a wine that would go well for people who are pursuing an active and healthy lifestyle. Gin and tonic in an adult can. Dedication to our craft for over 165 years. It's no wonder that we brought this amazing liquid to the United States. The idea of aging in Cabernet Cast is very unique. Denord is a place where people feel safe, where they feel welcome, where they feel wanted. And decided to create an organic vodka through a premium lens. The recipe that is genuinely history in a bottle. We started making spirits to share our appreciation for quality whiskey and the Central Coast. Salute. Yes. This wine pairs with everything. We've always loved bringing people together over great drinks because we know that cocktails are the ultimate social character. Pink Pig is a premium Añejo Cristalino that is shattering expectations. Welcome to the Cordial Liqueur and After Dinner Drink Competition in the 2021 Wine and Spirit Wholesalers of America Brand Battle Tournament. It is so fantastic to see that video and so many of the brands that we've been able to watch present and pitch over the last uh, three months uh, through the Brand Battle Tournament at this alcohol industry premier, premier pitch competition. My name is Michelle Corsmo, and I'm the president and CEO of the Wine and Spirit Wholesalers of America. We are thrilled to have brought you Brand Battle Tournament over the summer months to learn more about the brands that our wholesalers are seeking to bring to retailers and outlets near you. Uh, and I am very excited about today's competition. Um, the, the cordial liqueur and after dinner drink competition is one that is heating up, certainly in the pandemic. Uh, we've all talked about how uh, drinks at home and what you're doing with these types of products has really become so much more interesting to so many of us. And our team said that this was the most fun in watching the pitch videos. So I know today's pitches are going to be fabulous. Our wholesaler judges that are here to be our panel is a wonderful insight into the world of wine and spirit wholesaling. It's so much more than bringing those cases to your retailers. It's about finding those great products that fill out portfolios and uh, bring the next and best to your door. So before we learn about today's contenders, I'd like to introduce our tournament sponsors. 750 Beverage Media Group is the WSWA tournament media partner who's highlighted the tournament this summer and engaged with all of our contenders and winners. They have been a terrific supporter of the Wine and Spirit Wholesalers of America for years in all of our various programs, and we're so thankful for their continued support in this, our signature event. Other tournament sponsors include Beverage Brand Ambassador Academy, the Cocktail Guru, London Essence, Gap Promotions, the Wine Industry Network. Thank you to everyone for helping make this tournament possible. We really appreciate the sponsors and the role they play in our brand battle tournament. Today, you will be hearing from six different cordial liqueur and after dinner drink brands who will spend a few minutes each presenting information about their products. After each presentation, the judges, our wholesalers, are going to have a few minutes to ask questions and provide feedback. I encourage all of you watching to add your own questions and thoughts in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. We try and answer all of these questions that come through during the tournament and appreciate seeing the participation. At the end of today's competition, we will announce our category winner from our judges' votes and also the People's Choice winner for this category, who's selected by all of you, our virtual audience, we have tuning in to today's competition. The Judges' Choice winner will move on to the championship round coming up in a few weeks in September. Now, I would like to introduce our wonderful panel of wholesaler judges. Together, this group of wholesalers represents businesses varying in size from across the country and they bring over 100 years of combined industry expertise and experience in the wine and spirits business. These brands and industry leaders are always looking for the next up and coming brand. 
Now, our judges. First up, from Southern Glazers Wine and Spirits, we have the EVP and GM for Craft Spirits, Ray Lombard. Ray drives the strategy for Southern Glazers Craft Spirits portfolio. In addition, Ray manages Craft Spirits supplier onboarding, contracts, management, marketing, performance, and directs Southern Glazers highly successful fleet advertising program. It's nice to see you, Ray. Thank you, happy to be back. Next, we have Drew Levinson. Drew is the Vice President Business Development for Breakthrough Beverage Group. Drew oversees the national strategy, brand vetting, and execution of the emerging craft brand segment, and the Trident division, which operates in 14 states and Canada. Trident is de dedicated to leveraging expertise and brand stewardship in the pursuit of accelerated growth for emerging craft spirits within Breakthrough Beverage Portfolio. Welcome, Drew. Thank you, Michelle. It's great to be here. Looking forward to today. Yeah. And happy to welcome back Steve Fetty. Steve has over a decade of bar experience as a well-rounded member of the restaurant, bar, and hospitality industry. Steve is now the Artistry and Innovation Manager for Allied Beverage of New Jersey, where he oversees a dynamic portfolio of artisanal brands, account menu development, and spirits education. Welcome, Steve. Thanks for having me get back, Michelle. Kristen Rolofson is our next esteemed judge from Armada Distributing. She is the State Sales Director of Beer, Wine, and Spirits. Kristen spent several years behind the bar running many high volume beverage programs before joining Armada and has also worked for RNDC. Welcome, Kristen. Hi, thanks, thanks for being here. Please help me welcome Gary Shaw, Executive Vice President, National Sales, overseeing all national and international sales for MS Walker. Gary has been instrumental in developing the network of wholesale distributor partners who represent the MS Walker brand spirit and wine portfolio nationwide. Gary also has a leadership role in new product development within the MS Walker brand portfolio. Welcome, Gary. Thanks, Michelle. Happy to be on today's panel. Rounding out our panel for today's tournament is Troy Clark. Troy is the founder and co-owner of 1224 Cocktails and the Director of Mixology and Spirits Education for Martinetti Companies. He also served as President of the United States Bartenders Guild, Boston Chapter. He brings over 25 years of experience in the restaurant and hospitality industry, ranging from time behind the bar to years of executive food and beverage management and countless hours of continued education in the field. Welcome, Troy. Thank you, Michelle. Very excited to be back. Thank you all for participating in our Wholesaler Judges panel for today's competition. I look forward to hearing your insights in this category in particular. And I know the uh, contenders will be so happy um, to present to you. Now, I would like to introduce today's host for the remainder of the program, Jonathan Pogash. Jonathan is also known as the cocktail guru. He's a mixologist, a cocktail consultant, educator and cocktail book author with over 20 years of experiencing, experience servicing bars, liquor brands and sophisticated drinkers across the country. Uh, I hope you help unsophisticated drinkers too, Jonathan, like me. Uh, Jonathan's signature cocktails can be enjoyed in award-winning cocktail lounges and restaurants from New York to New England. Please welcome Jonathan back to introduce today's contenders. Great to have you here again, Jonathan. Thanks, Michelle. And I highly doubt you are an unsophisticated drinker. You are probably one of the more sophisticated drinkers we know out there. Um, yes, You're thank very you kind. very much. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. Uh, it is an absolute pleasure being here and being able to host and see the wonderful faces of our judges and as well as our contenders. Uh, for those of you at home, hopefully you enjoy this and hopefully uh, you uh, watch our continued sessions and also look out for these wonderful, uh, amazing emerging brands and buy them and drink them uh, later on. So yes, The Cocktail Guru is my company and I have um, been on panels. I have judged competitions at WSWA convention uh, probably the last 13 to 15 years, something like that. Um, and, and it is great to be here and to be able to uh, host the Brand Battle Tournament. I've really had a great time viewing the Brand Battle Tournaments this summer. I'm thrilled to be part of today's Cordial Liqueur and After Dinner Drink Tournament, which will feature fantastic new and exciting brands. I'm thrilled to be your host today and learn about these wonderful brands looking to get distributed in the U.S. Market, marketplace. Now, 
I would like to introduce to you our contenders for this category. We have to say this category was very, very competitive with many new and unique brands that entered. We are very excited to hear from six impressive companies who were selected to talk about their products, representing a wide variety of emerging brands. The contenders we will hear from today are from Shalar, we have Jill Cohen. Next is James and Daniel Donaldson from Chemist Chocolate Orange Gin Liqueur. Kevin Fowle is here from Tamarello. From LS Cream Liqueur, we have Miriam Jean-Baptiste and Stephen Charles. From Black Button Distilling, we have Jason Barrett. And finally, from Organic Mixology Chocolate Liqueur, we have Jason Monkarsh and Natalie Bovis. Now that we know which brands are competing to get today, let's get started and learn more about them. Please welcome our first contender of this tournament, Jill Cohen from Shalar. Shalar Vermouth is the result of four years of research and collaboration with a mission to encourage US consumers to enjoy vermouth as they do in Spain, a drink to sip and enjoy and not relegate it to the mixer shelf. Take it away, Jill. Hi, everybody. I'm Jill Cohen, and I'm the owner of Vinaberia Selections, a California-based importer and distributor importing wines from Spain and Portugal. Thank you, everyone at the WSWA, Judges, and Jonathan for your time and support of new brands. So let's get right into it. What is Shalar? Shalar is a vermouth, and vermouth, by definition, is an aromatized, fortified wine flavored with various botanicals. In this case, the vermouth is based on white Grenache and comes from Terra Alta in Catalonia, Spain, one of the most popular growing areas for this grape. Winemakers Tony Coca of Coca y Fito in Monsant and Silvia Pujol of the Cellar Vans Algar and Terra Alta, who are frequent winemaking collaborators, spent four years coming up with the right alchemy for Shalar, which was first released in Europe in May of last year. Using over 30 local aromatic plants and spices to infuse the vermouth, they wanted to bring a wine that is evocative of place and give the, the vermouth a truly Mediterranean feel. Using rosemary, thyme, chamomile, fennel, orange blossom, anise, and many other aromatics, which macerate in a hydroalcoholic solution for a month and then gently pressed. Meanwhile, the mistella, fortified unfermented grape must ages in 300 liter French oak barrels in a Solera system like used in sherry production that has at least five years of aging. And finally, the mistella and botanical solution are blended with the white Grenache, which has been fermented in stainless steel tanks. So that's what's inside the bottle. Outside the bottle is packaging that is both informative and romantic. The back label bears depictions of many of the herbs and flowers used to create shalar. The front label of a fin de siècle woman clutching some herbs is an homage to the early days of Catalan vermouth production. And the design is based on modernist art of the late 1800s, a time that saw the birth of the modernist art and architecture movement in Catalonia and the birth of vermouth. The name Shalar is a Catalan expression meaning enjoy. This is the romance of vermouth, which is still today a very popular drink in Spain as an aperitif or after dinner, most frequently with a garnish of an olive or orange. So Shalar in the United States arrives for the first time at the end of August of last year. August 2020, I can't think of a more challenging time to introduce consumers to a new product, especially one that doesn't easily fit into a category. Without wine bars and with restaurants closed or partially closed, and many wine shops closed for in-person purchasing, our opportunities to introduce Shalar were really limited. Just about one minute, Jill. Okay, so we did everything we could. We used social, we used our tasting list. We met with those buyers who were tasting. 
We put together holiday boxes to package the shellar to sell directly to consumers. Anything we could do to get it into the market. And then when it started opening up earlier this year, uh, cocktail bars started featuring it as a cocktail and we sold out of our first, our first order within a couple of months. Just about 15 seconds, Jill. Okay. So to that I say, taste it for yourself. It's extremely versatile and it's delightful. Shalar. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jill. Uh, perfectly on time. Uh, now let's bring back our panel of judges for some delicious Q and A. How about that? Let's start with Ray. Uh, Ray, what are your questions and uh, feedback if you have any? So, what vehicles are you using to get your story of the craft, the uh, the whole, the, the Solera, the aging, the ingredients? What vehicles are you using to uh, to get the craft behind the uh, Shalar? to the marketplace, any mixologist or bartender outreach? Well, uh, the bartender art, uh, outreach wasn't able to start until a few months ago for obvious reasons, because there were no bars. Um, we have started meeting with bartenders, uh, particularly um, where we are already selling wine, but also beyond that. Um, the craft aspect, I mean, I certainly, certainly haven't gone to that level of the detail with the Solera, um, but certainly we've been emphasizing the versatility of, of the drink uh, before dinner, after dinner, in a cocktail. So uh, to encourage bartenders to really create something of their own. Yeah. Also, given uh, vermouth sales are in uh, the top five markets are approximately 70% of the uh, vermouth sales. Are you looking for any focused market strategy and what's your retail price point and how are you looking uh, to get the brand out there? So the retail price point is around $30 and we chose that price because after speaking with some boutique retail wine shops, uh, I wanted to be below kind of the ultra premium artisan vermouths and still at a price point that showed it was a premium product, but still accessible to adventurous consumers. Um, Mr. Steve Fetty, I see that you have your uh, hand raised. Uh, yes, so thank you for hitting the price point. That was one of my two questions. Second one, you mentioned social media and uh, my fellow judges told me that it was actually on your importer uh, social media handle. How come there is no like specific focus on this particular brand? I mean, despite being in the market for only one year, I mean, if we've learned anything, social media is the way to our consumers now. You know, part of it is uh, I don't own the brand, the producer owns the brand. And so they've been controlling the Shalar name. Uh, certainly part of the, the idea of entering this brand battle competition was to see what kind of interest we got on other than a regional basis. But it was not something, I mean, I have promoted, uh, at, you're correct, on my, my importer distributor social, but haven't been able to use the Cholar name because it's not mine, essentially. All right, thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe a, another quick question. Uh, Kristen, do you have any uh, a quick question or any quick feedback? Sorry, I was muted. Um, I, I understand that uh, there's a lot of focus on the on-premise side of the business. I'm just curious to know what your major focus is going to be in the retail side. Clearly, we build brands on-premise and then we get pulled through in retail. What's your one main focus for retail? Well, we had to start with retail. So because we, we didn't have the on-premise availability when we first brought the product in. Um, that's where we've been using cocktail cards and gift boxes and um, cards with explanations of what the product is, what it does, where it's from, to try to get some uh, recognition. And then also some of our uh, retailers who do taste for their customers, we've given them bottles so that they could encourage their customers to, to taste the chalar um, uh, as, uh, as a pathway to purchase. Thank you. Uh, amazing. Thank you so much, Jill, um, for kicking us off. So now on to our second presenter, James and Danielle Donaldson from Chemist Chocolate Orange Liqueur. 
gin liqueur. This decadent gin liqueur features the classic combination of orange and chocolate. James, please do tell us more about your brand. James and Danielle. <laughs> yeah, uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Asheville, North Carolina. I'm James Donaldson, uh, one of the owners here at Chemist Spirits. And with me today is my beautiful wife and also uh, one of the owners here, Danielle. Um, and I'm the chemist from Chemist Spirits. Um, so first we wanna start by thanking you all um, for allowing us to participate in this competition. Um, we're honored to be going up against some amazing brands. So thank you very much. Um, so our family owned and run distillery all started in the mountains of North Carolina on my mom and our founder, Chemist Spirits, Debbie Word, on her stove um, in a five gallon copper pot still. Um, we spent numerous hours um, Researching. <laughs> Researching um, and making our recipes what they are today. Yeah, we're called Chemist Spirits, not just because my wife is a doctor of pharmacy here in Asheville, uh, but because we wanted to celebrate the pharmacist during Prohibition that really kept spirits alive. Because of that, we focus our branding, which is all done in-house, on really capturing this essence of the turn of the century apothecary style. So as you can see here, even the logo is a riff on the classic symbol of pharmacy, uh, the bowl of Hygieia. And um, uh, we try to carry this theme through all of our products, uh, as well as the actual brick and mortar location here. So you can see we're in our downtown cocktail lounge in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, all of this was built and designed um, to reflect that pharmacist of prohibition era um, kind of theme and apothecary. Yeah, so tradition and the old world style is really important to us. We wanna bring our customers into our brand in a new way. Because of that, our process uses classic direct fire hand hammered copper Olympic stills, which are perfect for capturing the exact botanical profile that we're looking for. Our focus has always been quality botanicals and really the best process that we can find. Um, so two of our core principles in producing our products here um, is versatility and drinkability. We wanna make sure that you could just sip our products neat and they're delicious, but also that they're versatile. So we work with our mixologists in our bar here, even before our products hit the market to make sure um, that we don't need to make any changes to make sure that our products will go great in all the classic cocktails and play well with others. Um, so it's, it's yeah. a great place to be able to research. Because of that, we knew right out the gate, we wanted to do an American style gin. Our very first gin is an American style, which really just downplays the juniper and allows us to focus on a broader range of botanicals, some juicy citrus, and uh, notes of florals and spice. Uh, from there, we move on to our Navy Strength Gin, which uses the exact same American gin, just overproof and uh, flavored with Thai ginger and Spanish sweet orange. Um, so we also take our American gin and barrel rest it um, in new white oak charred uh, barrels um, for just a little while to get that vanilla sweetness and the caramel. And that's really important because that's the base of our newest and most popular product, our chocolate orange gin liqueur. Um, so what goes into this is our barrel rested gin. Um, we then sweeten um, and add, we use cacao husks um, as well as Spanish sweet orange to, to sweeten. We, um, we use all natural products, nothing artificial goes into it. Yeah, and what's really interesting is we tried a variety of cacao in this process. And if you've ever had a Terry's sweet orange or a Terry's chocolate orange, that's the flavor profile that we're going for here. Uh, but we discovered that using a byproduct of the chocolate making process uh, was really the best way to do it. It created the best profile and it allowed us to work with local chocolate producers, French broad chocolates. So we uh, produced this about with- About 20 seconds to go. Okay. Okay, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, this is uh, one of our favorite products and um, we uh, hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, and, and always remember, Chemist Spirits is the cure for the common cocktail. You can enjoy this in drinks, um, common cocktails, as well as just drink it on its own. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you so much, James and Danielle. That bar is beautiful. Um, now <laughs> let, let, let's bring back our panel of judges for some more Q&A. Uh, Drew, why don't you go ahead and kick off our questions this round? Well, first of all, congratulations. It is a beautiful bar. Uh, I think you did a great job on the package and trying to get, uh, you know, capture that apothecary and apothecary style that, that you're going for. Um, and it sounds like you have a nice little range of products going uh, forward. Um, you know, when you get into this liqueur phase, you know, talk to me a little bit more um, about the process of how you get the, the chocolate and the cacao in there, in the stills. 
Is it a maceration or is it, a, in, is it a, uh, um, you know, how is that actually working? And then secondarily, you know, it, it can be confusing for the consumer to have the gin base on the label. I know that's your, your sweet spot. Uh, how do you plan to, you know, navigate that field when you're talking about a liqueur, but still a gin base, which uh, maybe the traditional consumer might be challenged by? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, so with our chocolate orange gin liqueur, um, we start with our barrel age. Um, it's already distilled. Um, so the sweetness and the cacao husks and orange, sweet orange are added afterwards. Mm -hmm. So we put the gin in, um, we add the sugar and, and it's, a, it's an afterwards process. So mm -hmm. the actual sweetening and all that is after. Yeah. And in terms of using gin um, on the actual packaging, we use that as a differentiator. We already have a consumer base that knows our gins and we have a reputation for a certain profile of gin. So the fact of the matter is there is a juniper flavor profile in this as well as citrus that we're pulling from our barrel rested. So we wanted to communicate that to the customer and it hasn't been a barrier uh, to success so far. And I would say that um, it makes the, it's for some, it actually makes it more versatile because you can actually use the liqueur um, in just classic cocktails mm -hmm. um, as an, as a modifier, but also in place of, of some gins and some in certain cocktails. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. Uh, Gary, do you have a, a quick question or any kind of feedback for, for James and Danielle? Uh, I, I do. Um, thank you, Danielle and James, for the presentation. I really appreciate it. And um, I, I also, as Drew said, I, I do like the packaging. Um, I, I also was curious about using gin as a base. It's not a usual uh, base for cordials and liqueurs, but I think it works beautifully and the combination of chocolate and orange uh, is really well balanced. So I, I just want to ask you a couple of things. Uh, one, um, your kind of your target, what you're looking, uh, you know, as, a, as I know it's a broad category, but what you look at as kind of your um, target audience, number one, um, your price point, number two, and what channel do you see your success coming from? Is it on-premise, off-premise, and, and kind of the focus behind uh, the channel support? Um, yeah. So our price point is between $35 and $39, uh, depending on what state you're in. Mm -hmm. um, I would say our, our target, so um, originally this product was meant to be a limited release holiday, but it was, it just took off mm -hmm. um, on-premise. So we have, it has been our most popular on-premise um, bottle purchase um, since it came out, yeah. um, but it's also um, making its round in bars. Um, right, so uh, we uh, have seen immediate success, um, especially out of our bottle shop with home buyers, people that wanna play around with this at home. It's a great COVID cocktail uh, additive or something you drink on your own. Um, but we have seen, we cannot keep it in stock right now in some of our new markets in Georgia, for instance, where bars are picking it up and using it as modifiers, especially leading into the holidays. It's an easy way to add a twist on a variety of classic cocktails. Um, and with our American gin, we actually just launched um, in the UK in July. Um, they just sent out 100,000 bottles um, out of the London Craft um, Gin Club. We were the first American gin that was featured mm -hmm. um, in the London Craft Gin Club. And they are very excited about the um, gin orange liqueur because it's it's something that they've never seen before and people are really excited to, to start um, getting that there. Yeah. All right, awesome. Uh, thank you so much, James and Danielle. Um, so uh, now uh, on to our third contender. So we have Kevin Fall from Tamarello. Tamarello is the first American made tamarind liqueur. Take it away, Kevin. Thanks everyone and thank you very much for including us in this competition. I'm gonna jump right into it to save everybody time and um, to get out what I'd like to say. So imagine a flavor popular among 90% of the world's population. That's 6.9 billion people. These flavor cultures make up 36% of the people in the United States. That's nearly 120 million people. Now imagine this special flavor hardly exists as a cordial. This presents a unique opportunity to fulfill demand by creating a product from this flavor. But I didn't know any of this when I, when I, uh, a friend of mine from graduate school who grew up in Mexico gave me a piece of tamarind candy at the Cinco de Mayo Festival in Portland, Oregon in 2008. I just knew my life was changed forever because I fell in love with tamarind. I didn't know that 120 million people in the United States are the fastest growing buyer power demographic. I didn't know that tamarind margaritas are the second most popular flavor in Mexico or the 6.9 billion people consume it in agua frescas, chutneys, jellies, sodas, candies, soups, sauces, desserts, 
or straight from the shell. I just knew I loved it and I knew others loved it. So in 2015, I started working on recipes for Tamarello, what became the first American made tamarind liqueur. Over the next three and a half years, I took each recipe to ethnic restaurants around Los Angeles. I listened to their feedback, iterated, and did it again 14 times until they loved the recipe too. I learned firsthand that making tamarind liqueur from extracts avoided the potentially stomach grumbling side effects of using raw tamarind. So we mixed tamarind and other extracts with a small amount of chili pepper, 60 uh, time filtered GNS and pure cane sugar to achieve Tamarello's unique flavor. It's bottled at 15% alcohol by volume, 30 proof. Our sales and distribution strategy can be visualized by imagining an upside down pyramid where the tip balances on the ground. The tip of the pyramid is ethnic restaurants. These have high flavor awareness and relate to our brand. The most popular ethnic restaurants are from cultures that love tamarind. Combined, there are over 117,000 of these on-premise ethnic restaurants in the United States fitting this profile. 54,000 Mexican Latin American, 41,000 Chinese, 14,000 Thai Vietnamese, 5,000 Indian, 3,000 Japanese, and some others. The next tier of the pyramid are premium on and off premise accounts that may be referred to as specialty or high-end ethnic chains. At the top, forming the greatest number of customers are the big box off-premise accounts and on-premise restaurant chains with 50 or more locations. Our brand was designed with all of these customers in mind. Where many cordials sell for over $32 per bottle, Tamarello is priced at an SRP of $23.85 with some retailers pricing it at $29.99 for faster sell-through. We call this affordable premium pricing based on demographic research that tells us how we can move volume product. Affordability creates success. We're also a sustainable company. Included in this affordable premium positioning is packaging that is 99% recyclable or biodegradable, including our patent pending all cork tea stopper. Our labeling was designed with the help of one of the industry's best brand designers. Our rooster insignia is the one symbol universally heralded among tamarind loving cultures. It brings luck, good fortune, energy, strength, and humor. The bottle is designed to be easily grabbed by one, uh, by any size hand while the packaging stands out on the shelf of any back bar. Just about one retail minutes. store. We support distribution through print, digital, and social advertising. We have at the advantage of connections at some of the world's top publications representing millions of impressions. As one example, shortly after launch, Forbes covered us with the first article about Tamarello. We're connected to social media influencers. Some of them we can't mention today, but some of them we can. Put together visual images of all our go-to-market cocktail recipes with the help of artist Katie Rogers, who has over 550,000 followers on Instagram. Ben Ueda, who's promoting seconds. this event itself, has over 200,000 followers and will be actively involved in promoting the brand in unique ways. There are more. We can turn on digital assets to support sales of our product in any region in the United States. Tamarello is a brand with dramatic potential to grow your portfolio driven by intrinsic cultural demand through on and off premise accounts within the fastest growing consumer market segment, positioned to avoid portfolio cannibalization while expanding market opportunities and traditional accounts for long-term acceleration. Kevin, uh, time, is, time is up, my friend. Uh, I know- it goes by quickly. Um, thank you so much. Um, now let us bring back our panel of judges for some more Q&A. Uh, Mr. Steve Fetty, my friend, what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, uh, Kevin, I just want to say congratulations. This, this is delicious. Um, I think, you know, at being a bartender, uh, getting tamarind into a cocktail is difficult unless you live next to like a really good market or you have it here by fresh or you've got a good prep kitchen in the back to take care of it for you. So uh, kudos to that. Two questions for you. Um, why, I guess, how are you getting to that low ABV mark and why do you want to be there? Yeah, so I mean, if you look at the trend of alcohol sales in general, things are going lower. People are sort of, you know, um, uh, sort of regulating their intake because they want to enjoy more drinks in general. So we want it to be uh, influencing the flavor and not so much the high alcohol. The great thing about Tamarello is you can mix it with any other spirit. Mix it one-to-one -one with, mar with uh, tequila or two-to-one with tequila. And you have a tamarind margarita right out of the bottle. So the 15% alcohol by volume really focuses on the flavor and a high alcohol content would detract a little bit from that flavor because tamarind is such a profile of uh, that acidity and that tartness. So we wanted to focus on the flavor and not on uh, instilling a lot of alcohol. Okay. And that other question I had for you um, was what's the supply like for this? I mean, this is something where I think you can really get it to a lot of different places. Like you mentioned, all those different tiers. But as far as like, you know, uh, are, is there going to be a shortage or are you running into issues or any, anything like that? Great question. And uh, there's not a lot of familiarity with tamarind in the United States, uh, but the tamarind supply is huge. And uh, my background is actually on business development and um, lean manufacturing conversion too. I own another company that's a factory 
So a lot of my focus is on the operations side. And we've developed this so that the, the supply side is scalable. And, um, and the great news is that we have scalability. So if someone wanted to go into 20 states, all of a sudden we could do 20 states um, without an issue, no problem. We can scale pretty quickly. Nice. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see, someone who knows about um, mixability and flavor, Mr. Troy Clark, do you have a, um, a comment or a yes. question? <clears throat> Yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, first, I want to say uh, uh, really nice that you, you know, with a liqueur like this or anytime you're in a category like this, uh, to have a recipe of a cocktail in the back for consumers that don't know what to do and where to begin. I thought that was really smart on you and then capturing um, a top selling cocktail there. Uh, really, really nicely done there. Um, my couple of questions I had uh, is what's the production of this um, in sense of what is your sweetening source? It seems like it's not uh, overly sweet. So what are you using from your sweetening source? And then how, is it, how are you producing it? Is it a full maceration from the neutral grain spirit? I know you touched a little bit about that, but I wasn't too sure on what you're doing. No, that's, that's no problem. So um, uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, the sweetening source is sugarcane, um, but we use as little as possible um, both to meet that liqueur requirement, so it's, it um, meets the definition, but not so much that it overpowers the spirit. And it was designed, you know, as I said, I went through 14 recipe iterations. We took this recipe around to various restaurants in, in Los Angeles, ethnic restaurants that know and grew up with the flavor. And they were the ones that really, you know, uh, directed us towards where to go. And it's inspired by a lot of the traditional tamarind um, kind of desserts and delicacies out in the market. Now to make the spirit, as I alluded to in my presentation, um, raw tamarind does have a sort of a deleterious effect on the, on the digestive system. One of the side effects that's commonly known is that it can kind of have a laxative effect. So we use extracts and those extracts are concentrated so you get all the flavor, but you don't get the, um, the, the actual side effects. And that's a conscious decision that we made. So. Um, it's basically, we, we mix them together and um, uh, it, it sits in a, a, a sort of a mixing tank for quite a while and that's about it. So there's no maceration involved, at least not directly. Thank you, um, Kevin. That was amazing uh, as well. So uh, guess what, everyone? We are more than halfway through our brands who are presenting today. I hope you are all enjoying hearing from them and, fee and the feedback from our judges. Next up, we have Miriam Jean-Baptiste and Stevens Charles from LS Cream Liqueur. LS Cream Liqueur is inspired by an iconic alcoholic beverage from Haiti called Cremas. It is a rich blend of fresh cream, coconut, vanilla, cinnamon, and nutmeg. Take it away, Miriam and Stevens. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephen Charles. And I'm Miriam Jean-Baptiste. So LS Cream. LS Cream is inspired uh, by an uh, ancestral recipe from Haiti called Cremas. Basically, it's notes of nutmeg, cinnamon, coconut, and vanilla all together. And the story goes, it's pretty simple. It, we grew up with this. Uh, every celebration, every Asian uh, function, uh, weddings, baptism, first communion, you name it, there was always a bottle of Cremas somewhere that somebody prepared ready to be shared with your friends and family. We grew up with this and one, uh, one time during the holidays, we were like, why is it that to have this de delicious recipe, every time somebody needs to go in the kitchen, spend seven to eight hours, spend a hundred dollars plus in, in words of ingredient to come out with a small batch and get ready to, to share it with people. So we were like, why, why is it that we cannot go buy it at the store? So that's when we decided to dive into the, the, the spirits industry and figure out that, yeah, okay, this is why, because nobody thought about it, right? So we decided to take the taste of cremas and basically bottle it and put it in the form of a, tra a more quote unquote traditional, traditional cream. Traditional cremas is more thick, more on the dessert side of it, but the taste is still unique. And basically we started with this and we got our first samples in 2014 of LS Cream and we won a gold medal for the taste of the product at the WSWA. Uh, taste competition. And this is what uh, started our adventure. And we uh, soon, soon after we, we entered the SAQ up in Montreal, Quebec. Uh, and we had success over there. And we, we persevered. And now we're in the US and we're uh, currently in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Florida, and just entered uh, California. 
And in, in Florida, we are in all total mines and all uh, Sam's Club uh, locations. And we are going as we speak. So what I think makes LS very unique is not only its versatility, you're able to drink it directly on ice or you can mix it with different types of spirits. And the retail price is around $27 and $32 USD. For us, social media is the key uh, to reach not only our customers, but also to recruit our ambassadors. So people that do tastings for us in stores are usually our ambassadors that are already engaged in the brand that know about the product and also support us. Um, we're from Haitian descent. We're very proud of our heritage. And for that, we always try to give back to our community. And we partnered with Hope for Haiti, which is an organization that provides clean water to families and children in Haiti. And we're very proud to, to be able to support that organization. Uh, as for our expansion plans, we are entering uh, Georgia, DC, Michigan, Maryland in the fall. So we're very excited about that. And we also want to explore the um, ready to drink category, which is something that we always wanted to dive into. Um, I Can think I Stevens just about uh, one minute to go. Okay. Something that was really important for us was the design of the bottle. So Steven actually designed this bottle, uh, very premium and um, it exudes quality and it's also paying homage to our um, heritage. And something that was really important for us would have a distinctive logo. The LS is actually uh, my initials mixed with my uh, grandmother's initials. And also we wanted to bring diversity to the, the shelves. Uh, we, uh, as we are a black owned brand, we are the owners and uh, we wanted to uh, offer a little bit of our culture on the shelf. So Just cheers. 15 seconds, thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Thank you. Uh, looks great. Uh, thanks, Miriam and Stevens. Great Thank job. You. Now let's bring back our panel of judges for some more Q and A. Uh, Kristen, why don't you start off the questions? Let's go on. Let's go for it. <laughs> yeah. Hey guys, thanks for the presentation. Um, it's a beautiful, very kind of distinct cream. Um, my question is for markets that are unable to do in-person tastings. What is your go-to-market strategy? How do you plan to get liquid to lips, when you really can't get liquid to lips, what's your marketing for, um, for retail specifically? Right, so I mean, right now what we're doing is we're working with our uh, influencers to, we were able to ship to, to, to different markets. So uh, we, al we also had um, uh, the opportunity to uh, participate um, in so, like, a, 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 not fairs, but like more of like, a, yeah, exactly, like trade shows where even though the people can taste it, we can always tell the story. Some of the dry tastings and, um, and sometimes we engage with people afterwards. But uh, uh, we had the experience with, with COVID, a lot of virtual tastings. So people, uh, you know, even if it's uh, bartenders waiting for the things to open up and so forth, we were just mitigating. But to be honest, all the markets that we were in, uh, we were able to, uh, to to do tasting. So for, for now, we're, we're pretty lucky for that. And like, yeah, like Steven said, um, you know, partnering up with different influencers and also uh, being able to, to, to promote it. We're actually with a PR agency. Uh, so this is also promoting us uh, in that way. Uh, Ray, uh, you've got a question or comment. Yes. Yeah, so uh, shelf life on the product and does it require any refrigeration after it's opened? No, it doesn't. That's a good point. It's actually also gluten free and uh, make, made with all the natural ingredients. And yes, uh, no refrigeration needed after being opened. And uh, yeah, shelf life is uh, so basically we're, we uh, pr to protect ourselves, we will legally say that uh, two years would be the max. But officially from our producer, there are, there is no shelf life uh, on the product. Uh, Mr. Drew Levinson, another good friend. You have any uh, comments, questions? Oh, well, congratulations on the package. Love the look. It's a different style. Uh, talk about how you proofed it. And, you know, you see a lot of the cream liqueurs kind of running the gamut of proof. Um, was it intentional, targeted, you know, where, where you landed up on this one? Yeah. So basically, our, we, want, we just wanted to, to enter a market that when you really think about it, the last time that you saw a couple like us present the cream, like it, it, you know, it, to, to my knowledge, it never happened. So we know that we, based on our heritage, going to this category, we already we already bring something new.
to the category and just piggyback off of that for PR and our marketing strategy. And basically what we realized is that um, we experienced this in, in Montreal, I mean, in Quebec with the SAQ is the category grew. And what they were telling us is that we bring other people to the cream category. So basically we're, we're yeah, we're into the category. So that's, that's how we, uh, we had a proof of concept. Uh, I think we have time for one more quick question. Uh, Steve Fetty, a cocktail lover, connoisseur. Um, I do. I like the bottle shape. I'll give you that. And I love the story and the flavor is really fantastic. Um, you know, but again, coming from the bar side of things, I don't know how much is left in the bottle. And, and I don't know if you, you've looked at that or if you thought about that. Um, have you thought about getting maybe like a lighter tint, maybe like not as something that is so opaque, uh, just because a bartender is going to look at this and go, I have no idea what's in this bottle anymore. Yeah. So, okay. So first of all, yeah, it's something that we thought about. But at the same time, also, uh, we wanted also to make sure we protected the cream inside the, 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 the bottle. So we understand it was a trade off. Like, so basically, uh, we were told that uh, direct sunlight for whatever situation uh, it is cream could alter. So again, we wanted to go in that, that direction, protect on consumers. And then again, we were able to put it into bars. It is in restaurants right now. So I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it sucks, but Trust me, they got another bottle right, 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 ready to go. So yeah, <laughs> that makes that makes sense. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Miriam and Stevens. Thank you. Uh, next up, we will hear from Jason Barrett from Black Button Distilling. Black Button stays true to their vision of following their own path. Making adventurous spirits was born from this simple premise. Tell us more, Jason. Jason, you're on mute if you could start again, please. Oh, sorry about that. A little technical difficulties. My name is Jason Barrett. I'm the master distiller here at Black Button Distilling in Rochester, New York. We're a grain to glass craft distillery, uh, making everything from scratch from locally grown ingredients. So like several of the other folks uh, we've heard from today, our bespoke bourbon cream started out as uh, it was just gonna be a holiday special uh, but has been so well received that we now sell it year round. Uh, about a year after I started the company, my father came to work for me. And uh, you can imagine how exciting that was. He, um, he would work in the taste room and he's an engineer and he's a very literal man. And so people would come in and they'd say, what do you like to drink? And he'd be like, oh, an oaky Chardonnay. It's like, dad, that they wanna know what you like to drink here. And so finally he says, well, I like to drink Irish cream. Why don't you make something like Irish cream? I said, listen, man, I got no idea where we'd even start. You need some kind of special milk. Yeah, I'll, sure, I'll, I'll get to it. Uh, a few weeks later, I'm at a Farm Bureau meeting. I'm meeting with a farmer and he goes, uh, why don't you make an Irish cream? And I said, well, I, I would need to figure out the milk side of it. And he goes, well, I just bought a machine from the Netherlands and I'm told that if I add alcohol, I can make cream liqueurs. So here I am a few weeks later with our bourbon in the back of this dairy barn and the first bottles of bourbon cream were born. Uh, it was only supposed to be a couple hundred bottles for the holidays, but we were making a few thousand after that. And at this point, it actually is our number one seller. We've been in business nine years. We have 83 staff. We distribute in 14 states with mostly Martinetti, RNBC, and uh, Opeachy in New Jersey. Um, we take a very different uh, route to market than most. Uh, we are a very off-premise driven brand. We focus on that liquid to lips and educating our retail partners. Uh, we're figuring most of our consumers are taking this home and drinking it either on the rocks or in one of the cocktails that we actually print on the side, uh, you know, whether it be a queen bee with a little bit of honey or a root beer float, uh, bourbon cream and root beer. One of the questions I always get asked, why is it called Black Button? My family's actually been making buttons here in Rochester since 1922. I am the fourth generation. If I was to run that business, I am unfortunately colorblind. So there was always a joke when I was a kid that if I took over the factory, I'd have to switch to just making black buttons. So at this point, uh, you know, we're, we're having a great run of it, even though COVID has, uh, has definitely created a lot of challenges. We're up about 50%. Uh, 2019 to 2020 and another 30% 2020 to 2021. So it's an easy to drink, refreshing, 
uh, cream liqueur, a little more flavor than your Irish creams. The bourbon really stands up and uh, those caramel and, uh, and toffee notes really kind of punch through. So I hope everybody eventually gets a chance to try our bespoke bourbon cream. And with that, I will cede my last minute to the judges. Uh, great job, Jason. Very interesting stuff. Uh, love the connection with the black button. <laughs> now let's bring back our panel of judges for some Q&A. Uh, Gary, why don't we start with you this time? Yeah, Jason, thank you for the presentation. And uh, I, I am a, a little bit of a sucker for cream liqueurs. Uh, Notice that they uh, were drunk and not spit out uh, during the presentation. So um, I, I, I do like, you know, I, I don't, I'm not always a fan of black bottles. Uh, I think they get lost in the shelf sometimes, but yeah. I do think, you know, having the uh, recipes in the bottle is again, a very well done uh, uh, marketing uh, uh, acumen to you. And, and so, you know, thank you for doing that. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about how do you, and you know, engaging the consumer and, and what channel you're in, but, you know, we're all wholesalers. And, and one of the, you know, first steps is how do you engage the wholesaler? And, and you know, what is your strategy behind um, trying to create share of mind within a wholesaler that's, you know, tends to be busy uh, with a lot of products in their, in their um, house? So talk a little bit about what is your strategy to engage the wholesale sales force and management, and, you know, uh, to to actually help be your partner in the marketplace. Yeah, so our key portion with that is boots on the ground. We have our own sales reps uh, in each of the markets that we're working. They're calling on retailers, and when they're able to get success with one retailer, we then uh, you know make sure to inform the sales rep with our wholesaler, and uh, and ultimately that usually causes a snowballing effect. I also think that think it helps. This is a seasonal product. We do most of our business in the fourth quarter, I know most people do, but we're able to kind of give them the space they need in the spring, really ramp up uh, distribution through the summer and then deliver on results in the fourth quarter. So it's definitely a ground game. You know, if there was one magic bullet or one magic presentation that could put it in a thousand stores uh, overnight, I'd love to know it, but we just focus on the basics, calling on those retailers, partnering with our our wholesalers and uh, and showing them we can prove movement. Okay, and I don't know if uh, you I didn't hear the um, price point of bespoke bourbon cream. So anywhere from twenty four ninety nine to thirty two ninety nine, depending on the state and the markups. Good, thank you, Jason. Yep. Um, question, Troy. Do you have a do you have a question? Feedback, my friend. Yeah, no, I think uh, you know just to kind of um, echo uh, what Gary had mentioned about. Uh, uh, bottles getting lost, but uh, putting the cocktails on there, I thought was really great. Um, you know, not leaving any um, bottle space there uh, left undone. It's a, it's an opportunity for marketing, right? Um, I love the fact that the the word bourbon is really big on the bottle, um, capitalizing on that category and you know what they're doing. So great job there. My question to you is, um, you know, you have a, a pretty uh, strong following on social media with uh, twelve point three thousand followers on Instagram. Um, how do you use um, social media to help drive awareness of your brand? Um, as we know, that's an important part of uh, business today. So we really focus on two things. It's both uh, the it's simple cocktails people can make at home where you know, we're showing them how they can use the product. And then the second one is that more lifestyle shot where, you know, again, if you're going to have a party, here's something you could do for a group so that you don't get stuck mixing cocktails all night. So a lot of ours uh, really focuses on that how-to and then those lifestyle images uh, where people are taking it, uh, you know, out on their boat or camping or, you know, the nice part about uh, this stuff is, you, you know, if it's in a cooler, you can just drink it straight. You don't have to bring multiple bottles to keep going on things. Uh, so, yeah, those are the two pieces that we focus. We, we post about three times a week. We find that's enough to engage our consumers without oversaturating. Okay, we have about 20 seconds for a quick question. Drew. Uh, I was just gonna ask, um, you have a quite, you know, a number of SKUs within your portfolio, but focus directly on this, this SKU specifically. Um, how, you know, who are you looking at as competitors out there and how are you targeting uh, to be, you know, part of that competitive landscape? So we directly compete with Bailey's and Buffalo Trace Bourbon Cream. I feel most other cream liqueurs have tried to say we're almost as good as Bailey's, but half the price. We instead say that we taste better than the leading cream liqueurs and we're at a competitive price. Um, 
for most of our history, we've been within one dollar of them. And so we've always said, you know, for an extra dollar, you can buy local, buy American made, and buy a better bourbon-based product. Well, thank you so much, Jason. Uh, great job. Now, um, next up, wow, we will hear from Jason Monkarsh and Natalie Bovis from Organic Mixology Chocolate Liqueur. Ohm Chocolate Liqueur blends organic cold brew with our award-winning dark chocolate and sea salt liqueur. Take it away, Jason and Natalie. Hey, everybody. Um, nice to be here watching all of these. We are certainly honored to be in such great company in this dynamic category. I'm Natalie Bovis, and I've been involved with hospitality for over 35 years. When I founded the Liquid Muse in 2006, I was one of the first mixology-focused females bringing cocktail culture to the masses. Over the years, I've written several cocktail books, produced mixology and tasting events around the country, consulted for household name beverage brands, and taught organic cocktail classes to hundreds of consumers around the U.S. since 2008. I've also been a spirits and cocktail competition judge including WSWA. All of this means that I'm always watching beverage trends, both on and off premise. And one thing is for sure, nobody really wants the overly sweet, artificial tasting, goopy liqueurs of generations past. I believe that Ohm Chocolate Liqueur is a game changer. And I'm Jason Monkarsh, <clears throat> CEO and co-founder of Ohm. And as an entrepreneur and consumer, I personally embrace an enlightened lifestyle, and I really wanted to create a healthier, lower sugar liqueur and build a brand that gives back. So when Natalie and I joined forces, we set out to fill that gap in the market. Ohm Organic Mixology Chocolate Liqueur only has five grams of sugar per serving, compared to 40 or 50 grams per serving in many existing liqueurs. And through our donations to environmental causes, we've planted over 25,000 trees to date. We were also one of the first companies to give out reusable straws at events and use seeded hang tags, which grow wildflowers when planted. We're looking forward to launching our new packaging this fall in Los Angeles, New York, Las Vegas, and New Mexico, where it'll be on the shelf at a $34.99 price point. Ohm chocolate liqueur is made in the United States from a sugarcane spirit blended with certified organic cocoa extracts and agave nectar. It's 17.5 ABV, so it's light in alcohol and body, but rich in flavor. Ohm finishes clean with hints of caramel, espresso, and sea salt, making it a perfect treat, sipped neat, and ideal for our three ingredient, Ohm Espresso Martini. And the press agrees. Wine enthusiasts recently gave Ohm a score of 88, and the New York Times declared this chocolate liqueur is a keeper, touting it as the non-cloying alternative to other chocolate liqueurs. These kinds of great endorsements are helpful as we are expanding our social media influencer campaigns and hiring more ambassadors in key markets. Having these cheerleaders speak authentically to their audiences helps us share Ohm chocolate liqueur with both consumers and bartenders and bolster sales. Just about All one. of this great feedback has us more focused than ever on disrupting the chocolate liqueur and cordial category. Our new packaging features copper foil and vintage flourishes, a wooden cap and etched glass bottle, which are equally eye-catching on a restaurant or home bar. And we've kept our core value of giving back through our own Oceans and Mountains program, which supports a variety of environmental initiatives. When you enjoy Ohm Chocolate Liqueur, you join our mission to improve our communities one drink at a time. Trends come and go, but great taste with a mission will never go out of style. Clink glasses with us and enlighten your cocktail. All right, wonderful. Uh, great job, Jason and Natalie. Now, uh, let us bring back our panel of judges for some more questions and answers. Uh, Troy, why don't we start with you this time? Excellent, thank you, Jonathan. Um, well, first off, uh, I love the new package. I think you guys did an outstanding job with the change, uh, much more uh, versatile as we've heard before and grabbing the bottle, picking it up um, in, in behind the bar and, and utilizing it. Um, this is much more versatile and it really pops. So uh, really right, nice job on that. Um, talk to me a little bit about, um, you know, your strategy in, uh, in off-premise um, as we understand, you know, the on-premise play, but right now is uh, with the off-premise uh, surge and where we're seeing everything. What's your route to market off-premise? 
I'll, yeah, so, I'll start with, yeah, go oh, ahead. go ahead, Jason. No, go ahead. Okay, well, I'll just start with that. I mean, the pandemic gave us a chance to really kind of stop and look at that. Um, we redesigned our website also to reflect our packaging. Um, we have engaged a, a marketing expert uh, who specifically looks at online sales to sort of analyze what our sales were during the pandemic and who was buying and why. Uh, we obviously will be going back to having live tastings, you know, as as it becomes safe and stores are open to us doing that. And I personally am very involved with consumers. I always have been since I started the Liquid Muse in 2006. I've taught a lot of online cocktail classes and during the pandemic, getting back to live classes and they teach all over the country. So that's another way to do a very direct connection. Um, those are just some of the things, Jason, you probably have more to add. Yeah, no, I think the pandemic gave us an opportunity to build out a direct to consumer option on our website, which we didn't have before. And so, you know, um can be ordered in, in most of the states now and delivered to you. And so through that, we've done a lot of collaborations. For instance, we did something with a, a website called Taste of Modern um, a couple of weeks ago, sold through 20 cases in a week. I think the different collaborations with influencers and different sites is helping us um, get bottles into the general consumer's hand. Uh, very nice. Uh, Kristen, do you have a question, comment for everybody? I do. I'm curious to know, um, with your brand, one, who, whom are you, you distributed by in the, in the states that you're opening up? And two, um, where do you see your distribution in the next five years? Do you want to be blanketed across the nation? Do you want to be only in particular markets? Hey, Kristen, great question. So, you know, Ohm as a company has, has had distribution for, you know, years and, and key markets. Um, this new packaging is a relaunch of the brand and we're focusing exclusively on the chocolate liqueur for now. So that'll carry over to, we're with Southern um, in Nevada. We have distribution in California, uh, Michigan, where we actually create the product. Um, and we're launching, we're relaunching New York with a new distributor in the fall and um, relaunching New Mexico or Natalie's from uh, in the fall. I'd say five years out, we don't want to be, uh, I don't see this as like us taking it to 50 states. I think we'd like to focus on, you know, 10 or 15 real like key top markets and build that up ourselves. Um, and that, you know, that'll be enough, enough work for us uh, for, for now, for the next few years. I see that Drew has his hand up. Drew. Yes. Uh, thank you. First of all, love the repackage. I think you did a really Nice job. I remember seeing the package years ago and, and uh, how, it's, how it's evolved. So great job there. Um, I'm really interested because I've been talking about this chocolate liqueur space for a long time. It's really exciting to see two brands in this group that are you know, representing that. Um, where do you see this space going? How do you see it you, you know, growing beyond just the traditional uh, you know, chocolate consumer or cocktail chocolate consumer? Do you see it as a bigger category that just hasn't been tapped? I'll jump in with that first. Um, thank you, Drew. I think, you know, one of the things that we specifically thought about with Ohm is making it less sweet because like, for example, um, I've done uh, pairing dinners and used Ohm in a chocolate Manhattan. It did not become a dessert drink by adding the Ohm mm -hmm. into it. It deepened the whiskey that we were working with. And so that made it very food friendly. I think that that's one of the things about chocolate that, you know, until now has been very much like a dessert, a, des a dessert cordial. And I think that there there's cocoa and espresso and these really rich flavors that can be used in a, a variety of drinks from the dessert cocktails, but also in the, in margaritas, in, you know, food pairings. So I would love to see the category move further that direction. And I think that Ohm chocolate liqueur is perfectly poised for that because it is less sweet and it is more versatile because of that. Jason, anything else? Thank you. Yeah, thank no, you. I just... We're going to have to, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, thank you so much to all our contenders and judges. These presentations were really, really interesting and the judges feedback and questions certainly helped us to learn more about the various brands. Now uh, we will send our judges off to do the difficult, difficult task of deliberating on this category winner who will move on to the championship round on Tuesday, September 14th. While they deliberate, I would ask you, you at home to vote for the brand that you would like to see win the People's Choice Award for today based on their pitch and bottle. The vote box, the vote box is popping up now, there it is. Uh, awesome, so there's your vote box. 
uh, ladies and gentlemen. Cool. So while the judges deliberate, we will once again hear from Dale Stratton with SIP Source. Dale will spend a few minutes sharing that valuable information on the cordial liqueur and after dinner drink category. By the way, I wore my after dinner drink uh, shirt, if you didn't notice already, um, that WSWA has obtained this information, this data from SIP Source data. So Dale, take it away. John, this been, thank you very much, and uh, and your uh, your shirt looks uh, fabulous. Great, great to represent the brands that were uh, that were in today's competition. So as we look at this, uh, what what's happening in the marketplace, and we can see that the blue line representing spirits, and the and the bottom line representing wine. That spirits are really outpacing wine, and we've seen spirits continue to grow. Uh, that separation is getting wider. Something that we're keeping a very very close eye on to see what happens. Next slide. Uh, and, and Michelle mentioned the, the move in, in the front end uh, in her introduction about that move to home mixology and how people during the pandemic really did transition. But we're now coming back to where we're seeing on-premise bounce back. And we see spirits represented on the left-hand chart and wine represented on the, on the right-hand chart. And, and the upper line represents retail trade. These are 12-month rolling numbers and ending June. And you can see the various quarters along the way. But we see that spirits are jumping back much quicker. Uh, essentially, everything within the on-premise ended up the year down about 50%. Uh, spirits are now down only 4.7 on that rolling 12-month, where we see wine still down 22.1% coming back. Um, but certainly, spirits are outpacing that. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, cordials, liqueur, specialties, and we, we, we focused on the, on the spirit side here. Uh, but you can see here that the, that the cordial liqueur category is actually outperforming the total spirits category uh, as people are building that out. Uh, one brand that was represented in here was Vermouth. Vermouth is probably the best example of people taking um, home mix, uh, their mixology experience to the home. We saw an immediate growth in, in Vermouth and Vermouth expanded uh, and continued to grow throughout the entire year with the pandemic. Cordial's liqueur is doing very well. Uh, we expect to see these continue. Next slide, please. From price point standpoint, you can see here that the growth is really balanced across all price points. Uh, for uh, on the popular side, the, the, the entry level tier one is growing at 12.8%. Those are uh, cordials that are below $8. A lot of that going into, uh, into um, certainly into the on-premise. Uh, but all four price categories are growing and we're seeing the ultra premium category grow as well. Next slide. I think it's really important and look at this. This is a year to date number. So instead of looking at a 12 month rolling number, looking at a six month number. And this is what has happened for the first six months of the year. The yellow bar representing on-premise trend, the, the darker bar representing the uh, trend for uh, uh, retail off-premise. You can see what's happening here across all price points. It's that, that on-premise is really driving it. As bars go to open and restock and come up with their full-on uh, cocktail programs, uh, cordials, liqueurs are playing a very, very big role in that and are growing wildly in the on-premise. Next slide. As we look at it across regionally, uh, uh, again, the yellow bar representing the on-premise, the darker bar representing the off-premise. We see that total spirits are represented on the left-hand side with cordials represented on the right-hand side and cordials are outpacing across all, uh, all regions, uh, all divisions here in the on-premise. Uh, the, the Pacific is the only one right now that is in the negative, still at 15.6, but we see that across the country, we're seeing that trend, uh, that, that trend amplify, and we would expect that to continue on as we, as we, uh, as we see more and more uh, off premise or on-premise uh, um, outlets open up going forward. With that, we will turn it back over to you, Jonathan, so that we can get the exciting news about the winner of today's brand battle. Thanks, Dale. As always, this is great information. Looks like the Pacific is one region we kind of need to focus on there. That's what it looks like. Um, I'm now very, very excited to announce today's winners. First up is our People's Choice winner that all of you, our viewers, selected. 
So the People's Choice winner for the cordial liqueur and after dinner drink category is... LS, LS. All right. That is amazing. Um, congratulations to LS for winning your people's choice. There you are, Miriam and Stevens. Congratulations. Thank you guys. Okay. Um, so now. Uh, on to the judges' choice for the best in category winner, who will proceed to the Brand Battle Championship Tournament September 14th. So today's cordial liqueur and after dinner drink category winner is... Tamarello! Tamarello! Congratulations, Kevin! Thank you, guys. Amazing, good job, Thank my friend. Thank you guys so much, we're so excited. Um, I do, I do wanna say uh, it was a privilege and an honor to be part of this competition. And um, we did some pre, like some pre meetings uh, with the other, you know, spirits competitors and everybody's just so great. I mean, I would like to try all of the spirits, um, all the liqueurs. I think we should all get together and send each other little care packages or something like that. Um, if there's anything you know we can do to help promote you guys, it'd be great. But uh, we're so privileged and blessed. Thank you guys so much. Looking forward to the, the, the competition and getting our product out into the hands of everybody everywhere. Very nice. We'll do a little product swap. Uh, big congratulations to you on your win. Uh, so awards will be mailed to you in the next few weeks. Thank Again, you. I would like to thank all of our contenders who participated today. You all have great, really great, unique products. And I look forward to seeing how they do in the future. Also, I would like to take a, say a big, big thank you to our judges, our wholesaler experts for their thoughts, questions, and feedback today. It was very valuable for all of those involved. I hope you all had a great experience throughout today's program. For everyone viewing, all of the contenders information can be found in the online brand battle directory. The link to the directory has been placed in the chat box, but can also be found on the tournament website. We would like to make you all aware, but especially members of the media in attendance, that there will be a category winner virtual press briefing following this broadcast. You'll hear from today's winner about their experience and be able to ask questions to support your reporting. You can find a link to this briefing in the chat box or email Elena, A-L-E-N-A, -E at WSWA.org for more information. Again, we would like to thank our sponsors of today's tournament, 750 and Beverage Media Group, as well as our other tournament sponsors. We sure do hope you enjoyed today's tournament and all of the others that have taken place this summer. This officially concludes the Brand Battle Category Tournaments uh, in 2021. Wow. I hope you are all registered. Please do register for that championship on September 14th, where all of the category tournament judges' choice winners will compete to be the Brand Battle Champion. If you have not yet signed up, be sure to register at the link in the chat box or online today to save your seat. Have a great, healthy, pleasant week.